Okay, hello everybody. Um, now, on Monday we ended up here, and maybe I'll just say a couple of words about the microbe of the week question, which was about your senior pestis, the bacterium that causes a plague. So the first question was, where are the major virulence factors coded? And the answer was plasmid, on plasmids. So from some of the answers, I realized that maybe I wasn't clear enough about uh, pathogenicity islands and plasmids. So okay, you have the bacterial cell like this. And inside there, you have uh, the chromosome. And you may also have small plasmids that are also carried inside the bacterium. Now, virulence factors in pathogenic bacteria are either on integrated into the chromosome, in which case they are called pathogenicity islands. Okay, so each pathogenicity island is going to carry one operon with several genes that contribute to the same function in virulence, or virulence factors can be carried on plasmids. And in both cases, these are mobile elements of DNA. Now, in the case of uh, Yersinia pestis, the main virulence determinants are on plasmids. Okay. two of which are specific for Yersinia pestis, and one is uh, common among different Yersinia pa uh, pathogenic bacteria. So on one of them, you have proteins that are, uh, form a type 3 secretion system, so they inject bacterial proteins into cells of the immune system to kill them. On another one, you have uh, uh, an antigen that activates plasminogen, bacteria, so it will be involved in breaking up blood clots and attacking uh, the, the extracellular matrix. And on the third one, the third plasmid, there is, there are enzymes that uh, code for a capsule antigen, or allow the bacterium to produce a capsule antigen. So these are th three main things. And uh, the second question was, how do we know that present-day plague bacterium is the same as uh, the bacterium that was responsible for the Black Death and wiped out perhaps one-third of the population of Europe. And we know that because uh, bacterial DNA has been sequenced from the teeth of uh, plague victims that were buried in the 14th century. So we know for sure that that was exactly the same mechanism that was used in, uh, uh, that those bacteria used to kill people in the 14th century. Leaves a big question about the Justinian plague, however, in the 6th century, so that's one of the mysteries in historical bacteriology. Okay, so we left uh, Monday's lecture here with uh, the roles of lysozyme, attacks peptidoglycan, and then complement and antimicrobial peptides, which will have an important role in destabilizing, destabilizing the outer membrane of gram-negative bacteria. And both of these things, antimicrobial peptides and complement, can synergize with lysozyme, okay, so they don't act uh, just um, individually, these different elements of uh, soluble mediators of uh, innate immunity act together. Now, another important part of innate immunity is the role of phagocytes. Now, I kind of copied this um, figure, which shows the uh, major steps in the phagocytosis and uh, destruction of bacteria by neutrophils, which will be the main effectors and also macrophages. But mostly, mostly we're talking about neutrophils here. So we're going to have, firstly, recognition on, of bacterial cells by receptors that are on the surface of the neutrophil. This will lead to 
phagocytosis, in the internal internalization of bacteria by phagocytosis. And once they are phagocytosed, bacteria, the, the phagolysozyme will, will mature. And this will lead to the destruction of the bacterial cell. So let's have a little look at these different steps, okay? So binding, recognition. The important receptors on the surface of neutrophils that mediate phagocytosis will be complement receptors. FC-gamma receptors, okay? So that means binding of complement to the surface of bacteria, binding of antibodies to the surface of bacteria, opsonize these cells and allow them to be phagocytosed by neutrophils. So once again, you have a kind of coordination between complement and the cellular branch of the immune system. Also, you have other receptors which will directly recognize structures on the outside of the bacterial cell, like the mannose receptor, illustrated here, and toll-like receptors. So the mannose receptor is also directly involved in phagocytosis. Toll-like receptors, TLR2, this will recognize peptidoglycan and tachoic acid. So, helps the neutrophil to recognize gram-positives bacteria, right? Peptidoglycan, tachoic acid, gram-positives. Toll-like receptor 4 is one of the specific receptors for LPS. So this allows neutrophils to recognize gram negatives. Toll like receptor 2 and 4, they're not directly involved, not directly responsible for phagocytosis, but they activate neutrophils. So if neutrophils have these receptors that are, act that are bound, then phagocytosis will be more active and there will be, uh, uh, be uh, much more efficient at killing bacteria once they've been internalized. Okay, so if you look at these things from the point of view of the bacterial bacterium now, okay, so you've got the bacterial cell here. Peptidoglycan, LPS, or gram negative. If you've got a capsule antigen around the outside here, then these two receptors will not be activated, okay? Because peptidoglycan and LPS are going to be hidden by the capsule. Also, that's going to reduce the efficacy of the bind of activation of complement. And it will also reduce the binding of other innate receptors like the mannose receptor. So that means for ca encapsulated bacteria, a lot of the phagocytic capacity is going to be dependent on specific recognition of the capsule antigen by antibodies, which will not be present at the early stages of an infection, okay? Because you'll get these antibodies after, I don't know, being infected for, for two or three weeks. Okay, so that's the, those are the important mechanisms involved in the first step binding, recognition, and phagocytosis.
maturation of the phagolysosome. What does this involve? One of the main things that is going to happen is the pH is going to go down inside the phagolysosome. This requires ATP. So there's a proton ATPase in the membrane of the phagolysosome, which will pump protons into this vesicle. Also involved in maturation is the secretion of a lot of hydrolases into the phagolysosome. So proteases, nucleases, you know, DNAs, RNAs will be secreted into the phagolysosome. And also you have secretion of antibacterial peptides and lysozyme. So you have antibacterial peptides, which can disrupt the outer membrane. Lysozyme can destroy peptidoglycan. And then proteases, nucleases, and lipases, which will just pull apart, you know, chemically digest the components of the bacterial cell. And the third important thing that you need to know is the oxidative burst, which is very important for killing bacteria that have been internalized. So another part of maturation or, or, or the events in the, in the neutrophil that follow phagocytosis of a bacterium is uh, say, a, a, a significant increase in the respiratory metabolism of the neutrophil. So oxygen is going to be used by NADPH oxidase to produce these uh, oxygen radicals, which are then further going to be transformed into uh, hydrogen peroxide and hypochlorous acid by superoxide dismutase and myeloperoxidase. So all of these reactive oxygen species are going to be secreted into the phagolysosome. So this is basically uh, molecular bleach, biological bleach that will kill bacteria. Okay, so these are the two things that kill bacteria that have been uh, internalized. Reactive oxygen species, and then all these hydrolases that are secreted into the phagolysosome. Okay, so those are the elements of uh, innate immu antibacterial immunity. Adaptive immunity. Once you become infected, if you survive, then you'll be immune to subsequent infection because you have acquired adaptive immunity. And for most bacterial infections, it's antibodies that are important. Now, antibodies can have several uh, effects on bacteria. One of them is to block adhesion. So uh, if you have a antibodies against fimbrial antigens or non-fimbrial adhesins. This will stop the first step in the infectious process. And that's specifically important for IgA, okay? Immunoglobulin A secreted at the mucosal surface. Other antibodies can bind to transport proteins on the surface of the bacterium, and that can prevent its, uh, uh, prevent its growth in the human body. And that's particularly true if you have antibodies uh, against the proteins that are involved in iron transport. So siderophores will need a particular 
uh, permease to allow them to get past uh, the uh, outer membrane. So if you have an antibodies against that permease, then ion transport will be blocked. Other antibodies that are important can in inactivate exotoxins. So they, these antibodies won't prevent the bacteria from colon infecti infecting you, colonizing your body, or even growing inside the host. But they will prevent pathology. And finally, well, last but not least, some antibodies, or many antibodies, help complement fixation and opsonize for uh, phagocytosis. So antibodies against capsule antigens are going to be very important for this function. So in existing bacterial vaccines, the two major approaches are to try and induce these two types of antibodies, okay? Capsule-specific antibodies that will help complement fixation and phagocytosis, and antibodies against toxins that will prevent pathology. And just one word about cytotoxic T lymphocytes. Now, these are mostly involved in antiviral immunity. They kill infected cells, but they are important for uh, immunity against intracellular bacteria. So things like uh, mycobacteria, uh, rickettsii, chlamydiae, this kind of stuff. They only grow inside host cells. And cytotoxic T lymphocytes are important for acquired immunity against these bacteria. Okay, so before we go on any further, let's just try and make sure everybody has understood the uh, killing mechanisms inside phagocytes. So don't try and connect because my uh, connection is, uh, is, is not working. We'll just do this one by a show of hands. Okay. So think about this, which of these is true? of these are wrong. So there are several correct answers here. Everybody okay? Yeah? All right, so A, who says A is correct? B, who says B is correct? One, two, three, four. C, who says C is correct? Nobody. D, yeah, everybody, okay. Uh, e, who says E is correct? Okay, lots of people. Okay, mostly right. Okay, D and E, yeah, they're right. B is also correct. Okay, antibacterial peptides also secreted into the lysosome, but not complement. Okay, you're right about that one. And A is not right. Okay, acidification is very important, but it's important in order to activate the proteases and uh, nucleases that are secreted in the phagolysome. It's not a direct effect on the bacterial, on bacterial growth. But it's kind of a trick question because, as you know, low pH does inhibit growth of many bacteria. Okay, good. All right, now we're going to look for what is it, the remaining hour. At some specific examples. So we're going to look at one gram positive pathogen, Streptococcus pneumoniae, 
and two gram negatives, salmonella and different pathovars of E. coli. And it's going to get progressively more complicated, really, because Streptococcus pneumoniae, you maybe have about one or two pathologies, but they're kind of similar that are associated with uh, this infection. Uh, Salmonella, we'll see that there are two very different types of pathologies, and you have to try and understand why. And for E. coli, there are maybe three or four or five different types of pathologies that are associated with different pathovars of E. coli. And the main message that I want you to really understand at the end of this is that, well, it depends on which virulence factors the bacteria have, okay? So depending on what set of virulence factors are present, that's going to determine what kind of pathology occurs. Okay, so Streptococcus pneumoniae. As its name suggests, it's responsible for bacterial pneumonia. Also very commonly uh, causes otitis, so earache, infections of the middle ear. Now, both of these uh, infections are invasive, okay? So an invasive infection is when you have um, presence of bacteria in a compartment of the body which is normally sterile. So the middle ear, that's after the eardrum, okay? So normally you don't have bacteria in there, okay? Your outer ear, you have bacteria in there. That's not a, an invasive infection. But once you get these like little bones here, the middle ear, that's normally sterile. So if you have an infection there, that's an invasive infection. Same for pneumonia, normally in your lungs, it's a sterile environment. So in France, okay, the uh, Streptococcus pneumoniae causes maybe five or 7,000 uh, cases of infection, invasive infections per year. And the most serious are meningitis. So in this case, of course, bacteria, bacterial infection in the brain. 600 cases per year, and they can, of course, be very, very serious, resulting in death or permanent uh, handicap. Now, worldwide, it's estimated that before uh, the introduction of vaccines, and you had maybe one million deaths per year uh, caused by Streptococcus pneumoniae. And most of these deaths uh, were in children less than two years old. So who are the people who are susceptible to these infections? Well, very young children, less than one year old, less than four year old, and older people. Okay? So as you get older, then your immunity against these bacteria wanes and you begin to become more and more susceptible, specifically to bacterial pneumonia. So vaccination is uh, certainly recommended for people who have retired over 65 years old, and even for, in some countries, it's recommended for people over 50 years old to try and prevent these uh, uh, invasive infections. Okay, so that's the problem. How do you, what are the characteristics of this bacterium? Okay, Streptococcus, gram-positive cocci, catalase negative. If you streak them out on blood agar, like this one, you'll be able to see that the colonies produce alpha hemolysis. Now, alpha hemolysis is what you see here, is that when you have a lot of bacteria, you have a, a clearing of the red blood cells that are in the agar. So these cells have been, uh, have been lysed locally, okay? It's just underneath where the bacterial colony is. That's alpha hemolysis. Beta hemolysis is rather different. It's if you have a beta hemolysis, you can have a colony like this. And you would have a really big zone 
which in which uh, in which all the erythrocytes have been lysed. So that's beta hemolysis. Okay. Gamma hemolysis that means none. So once you've got uh, these two elements, gram positive coxy catalase negative with a beta hemoly alpha hemolysis on blood agar, then you would use a, a test of um, biochemical. Well, uh, okay, a battery of biochemical tests to get a species level uh, identification. Okay, so what else? So these colonies, okay, sometimes for different strains, they can have a different um, morphology, uh, transparent or opaque. Apparently, that's got to do with the amount of tachoic acid that is in the cell wall. And that has some relationship to uh, how invasive they are. It's not really entirely clear because both opaque and clear colonies can be pathogenic. Also, colonies can be rough or smooth, and that's related to the presence or absence of capsule antigen. Okay, so the smooth colonies have a capsule, and the rough colonies don't have a capsule. So, does this remind anybody of something? Very, very classic experiment that was important in defining the nature of genetic material in the 1930s. Griffiths and Avery. Okay, so they had uh, some colonies that were rough didn't have a capsule antigen. These, uh, these bacteria were non-pathogenic, could not kill mice, smooth colonies. If you culture them together, then these rough ones become smooth. And even if you culture them together with killed smooth bacteria, there is transfer of genetic information to the rough bacteria, which are naturally competent for the uptake of DNA. So this was uh, one of the first experiments that showed that, okay, it's DNA and no protein, which is the genetic material. So, so this is very old data from about the 1930s showing that the presence of the capsule antigen is important for pathogenicity. Now, when you look at uh, capsule serotypes, there are more than 90 serotypes in circulation in Europe and the United States. So it's very difficult to produce a vaccine which will uh, cover all of these different 90 serotypes. But not all of them are uh, responsible for invasive infections, okay? So the vaccine that is uh, recommended for young children and people and elderly people is Prevnar 13. So it contains 13 different capsule antigen serotypes. And this will cover most, most of the strains that are involved in, in, in invasive infections. So it doesn't protect against all streptococcus pneumoniae, but you know, it can prevent most in, invasive infections. So it's effective against pneumococcal meningitis and pneumonia. And it also reduces the incidence of uh, streptococcus pneumoniae um, otitis. Okay, so what are the virulence factors and how uh, do they work? So here's the, the, the different processes in the, patho path in the pathology here. So we go from adhesion, invasion, growth in the host, evading the immune response, and harming the host. Let's go through these one by one. Okay. So it's going to arrive, probably the initial site of infection is going to be the upper respiratory tract or maybe down in the lung later on. You're talking about infection at the mucosal surface. So what is going to be involved here is the PSP, pneumococcal surface protein, PSPC, 
which binds to the polyimmunoglobulin receptor. Now, what is that? Now, this is a receptor which is expressed by epithelial cells, and its function is to transport immunoglobulin A, which is produced by plasma cells in the submucosa. So these guys are producing antibodies, and the poly-IG receptor is going to export it out into the mucosa, onto the lumen of the whatever of the respiratory path airways. Okay. So IgA is going to bind here. The poly-IgA receptor is transported from the basal surface of the epithelial cell to the apical surface. And then IgA is released into the mucus. So this is part of your body's defense mechanism against infection, getting immunoglobulin A out into the mucus. So this receptor, it's empty, will then recycle down to the basal surface and pick up more IgA. Now, Streptococcus pneumoniae is going to use this as a kind of taxi service because PSPC will bind onto this receptor at the apical surface and use the transport process to be transported down to the basal surface of the epithelial cell. And so that's how Streptococcus pneumoniae crosses the epithelial bar barrier and starts an invasive infection. Okay, once it's down here, it's going to start attacking the extracellular matrix by expressing and secreting a hyaluronidase. So that's going to attack the extracellular matrix and allow bacteria to start growing. Okay, as we said before, one of the main nutritional requirements for pathogenic bacteria is to acquire iron from the host. Streptococcus pneumoniae expresses a lactoferrin binding protein on its surface, so that allows it to get iron, PSPA. The capsule antigen is going to be important in avoiding phagocytosis. So if you have a rough colony, doesn't have a capsule antigen, bacteria will, be trans will cross the um, epithelial bar barrier. They'll start to grow, but they'll be recognized and cleaned up very quickly. And finally, they secrete an exotoxin, pneumolysin, which will kill host cells. So pneumolysin, it's uh, uh, expressed as a, uh, it's a kind of hydrophobic protein. Uh, it will, uh, it's expressed as a, as, a, as a monomer, but it binds specifically to, to cholesterol in membranes, and that will induce the oligomerization of the protein, and it forms a pore. That leads to lysis of the cell. So this is will specifically lyse eukaryotic cell membranes. Okay, so the host cell has got cholesterol in the membrane. The bacterium doesn't have cholesterol. So it's a the lysine is specific for the host. Okay, and all these virulence factors are coded on pathogenicity islands. It's not related to plasmids. So these ones are going to be different between different uh, strains. Okay? Different serological strains have different capsule antigens. So this is what's going to be variable. OK, so that's Streptococcus pneumoniae. So for Salmonella. Salmonella are part of the Enterobacteriaceae, which are commensal bacteria in the guts of uh, terrestrial vertebrates. Now, some Enterobacteriaceae are strict pathogens in humans, so Shigella, Salmonella, Yersinia, 
these genera and considered to be strict pathogens. Some of them are or well, Salmonella, okay, it's a, it's a commensal bacterium in other animals, specifically in birds and reptiles. So one of the, main, one of the uh, reasons we, uh, we pick up Salmonella infection is because uh, the bacteria are present, for example, in chickens or even in reptiles that people have as pets like uh, terrapins. They don't cause pathology in these host animals, but if we uh, contaminate ourselves with them, then uh, they'll, they'll make us ill. And other members of uh, the Enterobacteria reactia can be uh, opportunistic pathogens like Escherichia coli. So that is to say, most of the time they are commensals and some strains are pathogens. Now, one of the things to be clear about with respect to Salmonella is the uh, designate the species designation. Okay. Now there are only two real species in the Salmonella genus. So that's Salmonella bongori and Salmonella enterica. Now often you see names like Salmonella, Salmonella typhimurium, Sal Salmonella typhi, this kind of stuff. These are all subspecies of Salmonella enterica. And it's a, an abbreviation because the real name is Salmonella enterica typhi or Salmonella enterica paratyphi. So just remember that they're all subspecies of Salmonella enterica. Okay, so how do you identify them? Well, you will be starting off with someone who is sick, right? And either has a systemic symptoms or local symptoms. So you'll be either putting feces or blood into culture, so hemoculture or copper culture. And you'll look for um, salmonella on a selective medium. So it's going to be selective for gram negatives, and it will have some kind of components which will allow you to identify bacteria that are lactose negative and produce sulfide. So the sulfide is going to react with iron locally, and that will produce these black colonies on an SS agar. So that's this one here, so Shigella salmonella. So this one is going to be your potential salmonella. Then you pick this colony, streak it out, and then uh, validate the identification at the species level with a test of, uh, with a whole selection of bacterial markers. So an API gallery, just like uh, in uh, practical classes. Then if you want to know, so you'll define that you've got salmonella enterica. Then if you want to know whether you have which subspecies you have, this will depend on serotyping. Everybody remember how this works? Okay, one of these is a positive result, one of these is a negative result. Okay, which is which? Okay, who says this is the positive? One person. Who says this is the positive? Nobody else knows. Okay. I, I, I forget, maybe I talked about this, maybe I didn't, okay? Right, so serotyping, the antigens we're looking for are H, O, and the K antigens. H, that's what? Don't know? K is what? Capsule, yeah, okay, capsule. O, LPS, yeah. So it's the sugar repeats the O's, polysaccharide repeats on the LPS, the variable repeats. H is, yeah, flagella. H is for heat sensitive, okay? So it's protein, it's, it's destroyed by heat, flagella. Okay, so these are surfaces on the outside of the bacterial cell. So you have antibodies that are specific for one particular antigen. 
And these antibodies are combined on the surface of latex beads. Combined or bound on the surface of latex beads. Okay, so imagine that we've got this. This is specific for antigen O, uh, I don't know, O2. Well, uh, let's not cause that. It will cause confusion. Antigen O4, okay? So if you have bacteria that express the O4 antigen, this type of LPS, then all these latex beads will bind to the, uh, the bacteria. And these beads and the bacteria will agglutinate. That's why you see this is the positive. You've got all the, late, the beads and the bacteria, they come together. Whereas if these antibodies do not bind to the bacterial cells, then the latex beads just remain in suspension. And you get a kind of uh, non-specific, very homogeneous, kind of uh, opaque solution. So this is visible just in, I, I know, 4x uh, binocular microscope. And it will work after about 30 minutes incubation at room temperature. So it's quite fast. Okay. Right, so serotyping is going to be necessary for determining which subspecies is present. Okay. So this is the Kaufman White classification for Salmonella, and it's based on the O antigen, so LPS, the H antigens, the presence of flagella. Now, Salmonella are rather annoyingly complicated because they have two types of flagella which can uh, which alternate in their expression so phase one and phase two is the type of motility that these bacteria have so they uh, will and it, they, are, they, they can have two types of motility which are associated with different types of flagella or just one type okay but basically they're off salmonella are always motile and VI is uh, the virulence antigen. This is capsule antigen. Okay. So capsule antigen only present in Salmonella typhi and Salmonella paratyphi type C. The O antigen, LPS, well, useful for some identification, not useful for all of them. So if you've got O antigen 6 or 7, then this is type C, Salmonella. If you've got O antigen 3 or 10, then it's type E. If you have 9, then that's definitely type D. But type 1 and 12, it's going to be uh, either B or D, okay, or A. So 4 is very specific for type B, 4 and 5. Okay, so probably your first step in the identification will be serotyping for the O antigen. Then depending on the result, okay, you'll know whether you've got a type A, B, or C, or D. A, B, C, D, or E, or you might not know, in which case you'll need to confirm with some typing for the H antigens. Okay, so those are different types of salmonella. Uh, what are they, they going to do to you? There are two main types of pathology. So first is a salmonella gastroenteritis, and you'll develop this quite quickly after uh, being infected. So diarrhea, stomach cramps, fever. So fever is telling you that this is an invasive infection. There are bacteria present in a compartment that is normally sterile. So the two main types that are responsible for this are going to be salmonella enteritidis, which is going to be a commensal bacterium in birds, and that's 
why eggs can be systematically contaminated with salmonella. So, I don't know, raw eggs in your omelette that haven't been cooked enough or uh, so I, some derived products like uh, uh, may mayonnaise or something like that can be contaminated with salmonella. Typhimurium, meat products, chicken, this kind of stuff, uh, and seafood as well can be infected with salmonella. So that's one thing. The other, the other problem that occurs is typhoid fever. So in this case, okay, so salmonella gastroenteritis is an invasive infection, but the bacteria remain localized in the gut, in the submucosa. But typhoid fever is a systemic infection. So you'll have bacteria in the blood. We have bacteremia. And this is quite a significant world health problem. There are about 21 million cases per year. And there's a case fatality ratio of about 1%. So it's responsible for maybe 200,000 deaths worldwide. Now this one is caused by salmonella typhi or paratyphi. Okay, only these two su subspecies. So if you have either one of these two things, what will have to you have to do? Well, for salmonella gastroenteritis, probably just have to stay away from work, uh, drink a lot of water, take it easy. Make sure you don't get dehydrated and it will clear up. Or if uh, things aren't going better in uh, another couple of days, you may need to be treated by antibiotics, fluoroquinolones and third generation cephalosporins. And that's definitely what you'll need if you have a typhoid fever. Okay, so salmonella used to be very important in France as a source of, as a, as a cause of uh, foodborne disease outbreaks. So if we go back, you know, 20 years ago, let's see the salmonella is a light blue line, about half or more than half of all uh, foodborne disease outbreaks were caused by salmonella. But since then, uh, the incidence has been going down. Actually, I don't really know why that is. Okay, so now, Salmonella is, uh, is like maybe only 10% of all foodborne disease outbreaks. Things like Bacillus cereus, Staphylococcus aureus becoming more important. So in France anyway, it's a less of a problem. Okay, so the, that's the problem. So what, what is happening during salmonella infection? Okay. So the source, the route of infection is through the mouth. These bacteria are ingested and they will uh, infect the gut mucosa. And what they do is instead of uh, just sitting around in the lumen of the intestine, is they will bind to M cells and induce their own phagocytosis in cells that normally would not phagocytose. So these, so salmonella will induce their own uptake. And that allows them to cross the epithelial cell barrier. So that's a function that's coded on pathogenicity island SPI1. So once they get across the epithelial cell barrier, they, they can be phagocytosed by macrophages, which will normally kill, the, kill these bacteria, right? However, they have a whole bunch of systems that allow them to survive within the phagocytes. So SPI1, okay, if you put salmonella on the top of an epithelial cell, then you find these epithelial cells that are not normally phagocytic will, will form a kind of a, um, membrane processes that uh, will phagocytose salmonella. This is SPI1, does that. So it codes for a type 3 secretion system. Bacterial proteins will be injected into the epithelial cell. Chain that will change change uh, the cytoskeleton and allow phagocytosis. So if, so normally of course bacteria want to avoid being phagocytosed, right? That's a big thing. They, they don't want to be taken up. It's 
especially by cells of the immune system. However, if that happens, then Salmonella will detect that they are inside a phagolysosome. And this is the function of what's called the faux P and faux Q system. And their role is to detect low concentrations of magnesium, which are apparently characteristic of the phagolysosome. And then they will induce the expression of different pathogenicity islands. SPI3, this is a, a magnesium siderophore. So it's going to pick up the low concentrations of magnesium that are present and allow the bacteria to grow. SPI2, this is a, once again a type 3 secretion system. It's going to inject bacterial proteins into the macrophage. And these proteins will prevent maturation of the phagolysosome. Okay? So you don't get too much acidification. You don't get the oxidative burst. You don't get secretion of lysozyme, lipases, antibacterial peptides into the phagolysosome. So that will prevent the host cell from turning the phagolysosome into a deadly environment for the bacterium. So that's how Salmonella can survive inside the phagolysosome. They prevent phagolysosome maturation. So FOQ, fo how does that work? So FOQ is a transmembrane protein in the, in the internal membrane. It will detect low concentrations of magnesium and calcium. So in those conditions, it's going to interact with FOP, which becomes phosphorylated, and a phosphorylated form will then activate the expression of other virulence factors. Okay, so which of these virulence factors is important for typhoid fever? Okay, so Salmonella enteritidis only causes gastroenteritis, whereas Salmonella typhi, okay, this is, as I remember, subspecies, so it should be Salmonella enterica subspecies typhi, Salmonella enterica subspecies enteritidis. So only S. typhi is going to cause typhoid fever. So if you look at the virulence factors, okay, enteritidis and typhi, you've got SPI1, SPI2, the FOQ, FO3, FOP system, and SPI3. So they can both survive inside macrophages. That's not the thing that, differenti that uh, differentiates typhoid fever from gastroenteritis. What does differentiate them is the expression of this, well, okay, the presence of the major pathogenicity island, SPI7, which is only in typhi, isn't present in enteritis. This is the one that correlates with typhoid fever. And it codes for the enzymes evolved in the, in the capsule and in production of the capsule. Okay, so. SPI7 is what is responsible for, let me go back here, okay, the presence of the capsule antigen in typhi and paratyphi type C. These are the only ones that cause typhoid fever. So how do we understand that in terms of uh, pathogen? Patho pathological process. Okay, so the way I understand it, at least, okay, is that um, Salmonella enterica, okay, the ones that cause gastroenteritis, they do all of this stuff. They can cross the epithelial cell barrier, they can survive inside macrophages, but some of the bacteria are extracellular. And in the absence of a capsule antigen, there's going to be enough neutrophils present to recognize these guys and kill them. Maybe they secrete uh, you know, antibacterial peptides that are secreted outside the cell, and complement is outside the cell. So these extracellular effectors are enough to keep the, inf the infection localized in the gut. But if you have a capsule, an if, you, if there is a capsule antigen, these extracellular bacteria are going to survive. 
right? And they can disseminate out into the blood system. And that's what causes typhoid fever. Okay, so let's just see if you've been listening, all right? Think about this one. Only one correct answer out of these four options. Okay, everybody got it? Okay, who says A? Nobody. Who says B? Most people. B. Who says C? Nobody. Who says D? Nobody. One person. Oh. Yeah, correct answer is B, right? Okay, A. That's false. It's true for Streptococcus pneumoniae, false for salmonella. B, okay, specific for salmonella, that's true. C is true for both, and D is true for both. Okay, good. Okay, so now we have about 20 minutes to consider the different types of E. coli pathovars. Now, as you all know, it's normally commensal, so we have tons of E. coli in our intestine. And it's a major part of the uh, aerobic or facultative aerobic uh, gut flora. However, some of these E. coli can be pathogens. So what are the characteristics of E. coli? Gram-negative bacilli and on uh, you know, kind of biochemical tests, what you're looking for is bacteria that are lactose plus. So that would be the definition of a coliform. But they are indole plus urease negative. And if you have like more than 95% of uh, strains of E. coli have these characteristics. So just these three markers are pretty good. So that will give you a, a species level uh, identification. Then to get different subtypes, you'll be looking at, once again, O, H, and K serotypes. So for example, Whenever you have a strain of Escherichia coli, then it will be defined by its serotype. So O157H7, that's a particular E. coli serotype. Now, pathogenicity, two types of pathology, either in the urinary tract, uropathological E. coli, or enteric infections. And we're not going to really consider these new papers. There were, it depends on what kind of adhesin they express. Okay, so you, you, urinary uropathological E. coli express a uh, fimbrial adhesin that allows them to bind to uh, uh, cells in the urogenital tract. So that's the specificity of, uh, of, of those types of coli. Oh, for enteric infections, you have four different types. Now, E. coli is quite banal, really, and uh, often not thought of as the most interesting bacterial pathogen in the world. But that doesn't mean that it's not um, an important cause, cause of morbidity and mortality. 
because it's the second most frequent cause of uh, infantile diarrhea. And if you don't have access to uh, clean water, this can be a, a, a risk of, of death through acute dehydration. So it causes a lot of infections and uh, can in indeed kill a lot of children. So the types of pathology are a little bit different depending on the path of R. So you have enterotoxinogenic E. coli. This will be traveler's diarrhea. Enteropathogenic E. coli cause children's diarrhea. So that will be this one here, the most frequent cause of infantile diarrhea is going to be enteropathogenic E. coli. Now you can have some strains that cause a kind of dysent dysentery. So these are enteroinvasive E. coli. And then the most serious one, the most life-threatening one is enterohemorrhagic E. coli. So these are kind of order, put, put in order of uh, pathogenic uh, potential. So they you know, progressively represent more risk for, for uh, of uh, serious illness or death. So let's have a look at them one by one here, okay? Enterotoxinogenic E. coli. So what is going to happen here is the E. coli are going to bind to the surface of the enterocytes, okay, epithelial cells in the intestine, and then secrete toxin and exotoxins into the enterocyte. Now, binding, this is going to be mediated by a whole bunch of fimbrial or non-fimbrial adhesins. And there are many different types. So that explains why you can get infected several times by this type of bacteria, because you know, we all live in France, we eat French food, we probably all have uh, antibodies against the uh, adhesins of E. coli ser serotypes that are circulating uh, in France, or e enterotoxigenic E. coli serotypes that are circulating in France. If we go somewhere else, these bacteria will be expressing different types of adhesins, so we'll be susceptible to them, okay? And we can, we can pick up a diarrhea easily. And everyone else in that country who lived there all the time will have antibodies, they won't get infected. Just tourists. Okay, the types of enterotoxin, uh, the type of exotoxin is very similar to cholera toxin. So it's an AB type toxin, it's going to be taken up by the enterocyte and will induce this uh, cell to secrete chloride into the lumen of the intestine. This will result in export of sodium and then water. So you get a very profuse watery diarrhea. So what else can I say about this? So this is a non-invasive infection. Okay? The bacteria, they're staying in the lumen of the intestine. So they're only present in a compartment which normally is colonized by bacteria. That's why it's non-invasive. So you don't get fever. Okay? You just have this... Uh, uncomfortable uh, diarrhea with a risk of, of, of dehydration. And the other thing is these virulence factors are carried by plasmids, so they can be swapped around between bacteria very easily. Okay, enteropathogenic E. coli. What happens here? Okay. Adhesion, this time in two steps. So firstly, there's adhesion by a, a type 4 fimbrial adhesin. And then there's going to be very, very strong adhesion by this protein called intimin. So intimin is going to bind uh, you know, very strongly to this uh, cellular tear complex. Then what happens? Then there's a type 3 secretion system. So which, so bacteria will inject proteins into the enterocyte, which cause the formation of this actin pedestal. So you get this very, very characteristic image on uh, electron microscopy, where the E. coli are here, they're sitting on top of this pedestal, 
uh, of, uh, of the, from the enterocyte. Now, that causes a problem because normally, of course, an enterocyte has got a uh, the apical surface is covered with microvilli, which are essential for effective nutrient uptake. However, if you've got a whole bunch of enteropathic E. coli on the top of uh, this cell, then the structure of microvilli will be disrupted. And that's going to reduce the efficacy of nutrient uptake in the intestine. So all the sugar, all the peptides that are not being absorbed by these enterocytes will become available for the bacteria in your intestine. So you'll have okay, trouble with the you know, absorption. And you'll have greater bacterial growth inside your intestine. So this is going to give you kind of, uh, kind of diarrhea. Not watery this time. Okay, you'll have a stomach cramps, uh, more diarrhea, diarrhea, you've got bacteria that are growing too much in your body and you can't take up nutrients very well. Here it's complicated because some strains also produce exotoxins. So details can be different from one strain to another. Okay, so this is, uh, what am I going to say? So this is responsible for infantile diarrhea in developing countries. So children who get this will develop antibodies against the intimin complex here. And then they'll become immune. So you get this as a, so this is, this is, this is a conserved, okay? Unlike the enterotoxigenic E. coli, where you have variable adhesins, this one, intamin here, this is uh, conserved. So you get this disease once, and then you're immune. Oh, ten minutes only. Okay, another name for this that you will do or will have done in TD, intamin, another name is the EAE adhesin. Okay, it's the same thing. Okay, enteroinvasive E. coli. Okay, this time you have rather more severe presentations. You have blood in the urine, fever. So these two things are, are characteristic of dysentery. So what is happening here is that this time you've got E. coli that are going to bind to the enterocytes, induce their phagocytosis like salmonella, but this time instead of staying inside the phagolysosome, they escape and they live in the cytosol. So this is very, very similar to what uh, Shigella does, in fact. Now, there's no exotoxin. And what is happening is that you've got LPS here that's going to be directly in contact with the cytosol. And this is going to induce inflammation. Okay? So it's going to be endotoxin related. So that's why you get fever. Okay, so you've got bacteria that are in a compartment that's supposed to be sterile, and this is going to lead to fever. So for this one, you probably need to be treated by, uh, with antibiotics. Now the last one is enterohemorrhagic E. coli, E-H-E-C. Now, this is quite generally sporadic. It's much less widespread than the other types of E. coli infections. And up until maybe about five years ago, it was known to cause infections in Western Europe, in North America, in Japan, developed countries, okay? Where, and it was always in, um, related to consumption of contaminated beef. So the idea is that the cattle are carrying these uh, EHEC, EHEC E. coli. And uh, if you have a hamburger, okay, so during a slaughter, okay, fecal material can contaminate the meat. And if it's a steak, it's all right because you cook the steak on the outside or the bacteria are going to be dead. If you have a hamburger, bacteria on the outside can be mixed up inside the hamburger, all right? 
in the, and then during cooking, it's not cooked all the way through, and some bacteria can be inside and they can survive cooking, then you eat them, and then you get infected. Now this caused a lot of problems, okay, mostly children under 15 years old. Now it's serious because you get bloody diarrhea, you get fever, and in a certain number of cases you have what's called the hemolytic uh, uremic syndrome, HUS. So hemolytic anemia and renal failure. And that's caused by a uh, toxin expressed by these EHEC called Shiga toxin. So what is happening? Okay, you have E. coli, they're going to bind to uh, enterocytes. They use the same bind, the same receptor system as the enteropathogenic E. coli. So it's this intimin system, okay? And once they bind, they secrete the exotoxin, the Shiga toxin, into the enterocytes. So that's going to kill them. So these cells get killed. That's why you have damage to the epithelial barrier here. So that's why you've got bloody diarrhea, because the toxin is killing these cells. So bacteria can actually, uh, because the, the epithelium is damaged, then bacteria can be present in the submucosa. But more importantly, the toxin can get into the blood, and it will also uh, be effective on erythrocytes, so it causes hemolysis, and it's very, very uh, effective against cells in the kidney. So you have the toxin that's circulating in the blood. You don't have bacteremia, you don't have bacteria, that are, around, that are in the blood, but the toxin is present. Now, it's very, very serious if you've got hemolytic uremic syndrome. It can be up to 10% of the cases here. And maybe you can have, uh, okay, I, I don't know. Uh, actually, I don't know the death rate of this, but it can be quite high. And there's no real treatment option. What can be done is you try and change the blood of the person. So you take out all the serum and you put in some uh, serum from other people. Now, in 2011 in Germany, there was a very unusual outbreak of enterohemorrhagic E. coli. So there are 4,000 cases, 50 deaths, so it's 1%, maybe a bit more. And that's despite, you know, very good, high quality medical care. No link to beef. So it was very, that was very unusual. And it wasn't the normal uh, serotype because EHEC is normally 0157. But in this case, in 2011, it was 0104H4. And it seems to be caused by an acquisition of this Shiga toxin, the virulence factor. So it's been transferred from an 0157 serotype to an 0104 serotype. And that's what made this bacterium so pathogenic. All right, what else can I say about this? Okay. Shiga toxin is carried on prophage. So it's a bacteriophage that's integrated in the chromosome. It can be reactivated, and then it can infect other E. coli and transfer the uh, toxin genes to other bacteria. And this is why you can't really treat this one with antibiotics because what we saw was the treatment for enteroinvasive E. coli or, or, or typhoid fever. Fluoroquinolones, third generation cephalosporins. Fluoroquinolones activate a DNA damage response in bacteria, and that will activate replication of the bacteriophage. So if you treat an enterohemorrhagic E. coli, with the same antibiotics with fluoroquinolones, that's going to activate prophage replication. So you have a huge amount of phage, and they will express more and more of this Shiga toxin. So in fact, if you treat patients with hemolytic uremic syndrome with fluoroquinolones, you can kill the bacteria, but you could also kill the patient, because before they die, these bacteria will produce more toxin. So there's no clinical benefit of antibiotic treatment for this type of uh, infection. And the last thing I want to say about this is that, okay, only in developed countries, okay? In developing countries, 
children get infected by enteropathogenic E. coli at a young age. So they develop antibodies against this intimin. And that means that they, uh, if they come into contact with enterohemorrhagic E. coli later on in life, they're immune because the antibodies will block binding. Okay, so I think that's about it for me. And any questions? Yeah, that's it, last thing. Okay, so if you have an enterohemorrhagic E. coli or, or different E. coli infections, mostly for the non-invasive ones, you're going to be depending on rehydration. For invasive infections, enteroinvasive E. coli, you'll need antibiotics, but not the enterohemorrhagic E. coli. Any questions? Okay. Right, thanks. So I'll see some of you Saturday morning, 8.30, right? Yeah, okay. And the rest in two weeks. <laughs>